case, a you know, guy going to UCL, UCLA, Weizmann Institute, Ben Gurion University of Negev, and he's supposed to be retired, but uh, he can't stop, and so he's now currently at the New York University, Abu, Abu Dhabi, where he's, he's teaching undergraduates and, and st setting up a, a new research program. Um, Joel is a tremendously influential figure. He has uh, written a superb book on polymorphism in the solid state. For me, particularly, uh, he's, his contribution in organizing the 2004 Ariche School on polymorphism, I think that was one of the most influential schools and, and continues to have influence and uh, lots of connections that were made then have been strengthened and, and, and grown, grown from that. So a tremendous influence. So Joe, without any further ado, I'd like to invite you to give your, your lecture, which we're all looking very forward to very much. Thank you very much, Colin. A very kind uh, introduction. And I'd like to thank uh, Bill and, and Ken for uh, inviting me to come back to this podium. I, 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 the first time I was here was back in 1983, actually. And, uh, and there have been a number of times since. And I can always recall Ludovico sitting over there and, and telling me, slow down, slow down, you're, you're talking too fast. And the other, the other problem that the audience had, and you may sense it as well, after a few days of very many Scottish accents, you're now going to have to suffer a New York accent. <coughs> as Colin pointed out, uh, uh, I'm currently affiliated with uh, New York University in Abu Dhabi, which is a very interesting educational experience uh, for me and hopefully for the students. And that was after many years as uh, as a faculty member at Ben Gurion University in Beersheba in Israel. And two, my, so I still have two feet in two very different, di very different places. Uh, this is, this is, uh, is going to be a, a, a big change in pace from what we had before coffee, a little bit more prosaic, a little bit more practical. Um, and I was asked to talk about pharmaceuticals and powders. And there's, there's virtually none of my own work here, and I had to pick a few, a few topics that I thought were particularly relevant and particularly important and, and demonstrative of the importance of, of powder diffraction in, in the pharmaceutical industry. And so that's what I've done. There'll be, I really want to concentrate on, on, uh, on, on these four, whoops, I'm not going to have the same trouble as as yesterday, uh, on, these, on these four uh, topics, and we'll go through each one in, in sequence. Um, as, as Colin pointed out, I've been involved in polymorphism research for the greater part of my career, and um, this, this uh, quotation from Walter Macron, who I mentioned in a comment a few days ago, is, is quite relevant. relevant. It's the, at least this author, that is Walter Macron's opinion, at every compound, notice the italics were his, has different polymorphic forms, and that in general, the number of forms known for each compound is proportional to the time and money spent on, in research on that compound. And of course, in the pharmaceutical industry, a great deal of, of time and money is, is spent on every compound. So the, the frequency of, of different crystal forms is, is quite high. And we're going to, I'm, I'm just want to start out by saying that when we refer to polymorphs here, well, I'll, I'll, polymorphs and, and, um, and crystal form will be the same. So polymorphs will include true polymorphs, solvates, and hydrates. And that's usually what happens when people in this, in this field get together. They use those terms interchangeably. Uh, <coughs> a while back in the, in the book that Colin mentioned, I, I, I stressed the importance of X-ray crystallographic methods in studying different crystal forms. And, and that's as part of an overall effort uh, to, to use many different uh, analytical techniques in studying the crystal forms. But probably the best, and as we say, the gold standard, are crystal, crystallographic methods, both single crystal and powder. I'll be concentrating, of course, today on, on the powder methods. So <clears throat> uh, the, first, the first topic is the crystal form screen. And we, what, we've heard, what we heard even this morning is the, the tremendous efforts that go into understanding biological processes 
And, and some of the support came from pharmaceutical companies because they want to develop new drugs. And, and, and the idea of developing a new drug is you have to get to a molecule. And it's a molecule that's going to, going to uh, take part, it's going to do the job when, you, when it's produced as a medicine. But once you have a molecule, you have to decide on which, which solid form to use. And they can be polymorphs. They, they can be solvates. Whoops. Uh, Solvates are those polymorphs. And then we make salts, solvates are the salts. A very active area is co-crystals, and they can do exactly the same thing. So there's a huge variety of crystal forms, and, and, and one of the ideas is we have to ca characterize those. So <clears throat> how, is, how is this done, and what's the role that, that uh, the powder diffraction plays in that? Well, many companies prefer to use the, mo the most stable form. Uh, occasionally, there are compelling reasons to choose a less stable form. It could be solubility or stability or, uh, uh, or processability. <coughs> and even for intellectual property reasons. And I'll get into intellectual property issues a little later on. So there's, a, there's this search for the best crystal form. And usually, lots of crystallization experiments are carried out. The FDA has very strict guidelines for uh, for determining the chemistry, manufacturing, and the controls of, of which solid form goes into a particular drug. And you can find these on the web. This is just the table of contents from those guidelines. So you, you can see there's a whole, a whole part on, on polymorphism, how it deals with solubility, dissolution, bioavailability, equivalence, <coughs> and, and so forth. So this is an important part of the, of the whole process of drug um, discovery and development, bringing a molecule to the market. That's a nice summary slide from, from uh, drug development today, uh, drug discovery today. Just to summarize some of the methods that are used in, in, in trying to uh, cover the phase space of, of crystals, uh, I just want to point out here that, uh, that down here in the, in the low time frame range, these minutes and seconds favors metastable polymorphs, or what we like to call kinetically favored polymorphs, whereas the longer crystallizations favor the stable polymorphs, and, and those would be what we call the thermodynamically stable polymorphs. This is just a few uh, of, of, of the methods that are used, and, and of course, any method is fair game. Uh, I tried to give a, a number of the references for more of these in a, in a recent pers perspectives that appeared in Crystal Growth and Design earlier this year, and you can refer to that. I think I referred to that in the chapter as well in your, in your notes. So what's the name of the game in, 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 uh, in, in powder diffraction? When you look at a powder diffraction pattern, you, we have to determine if they're the same or not the same. And that sounds pretty simple. But in fact, uh, there's never an exact correspondence. You can measure the same material twice, and you can find differences between them. And in the end, we have to determine, every one of us who works with these things has to determine, is it the same or is it not the same? And a, a, a certificate of analysis of a drug product, an active pharmaceutical ingredient, will, will contain, in many cases, a requirement that it meets a certain, it matches the current batch matches a certain reference standard, and, and you have to confirm, a person who's investigating that has to confirm that it is the same. And that requires something that a lot of us as chemists have learned to, to, to do, and that's, that's a, a, a bit of fuzzy, a, a fuzzy reasoning. If you get a list of, of peaks or, or a, a spectrum, it's never exactly the same. But we know, we've learned as chemists how to, how to make the evaluation on how close it has to be in order for us to say with a great deal of confidence that it is. But the absolute correspondence is almost never there. And, and so the, this whole idea of determining whether it's the same or not the same is a very important part of the whole, uh, of the whole use of powder diffraction in this game. So here, here's, here's just an, an example. Of, of the kind of things we run into. There, these are two different, two different polymorphs and an amorphous form, just to show the difference. 
And we'd have to compare them. And I don't think anybody in the audience would have any trouble doing that. These two are clearly different. But one of the things we've learned to look at is, is the low angle region where, where there, the density, as we've seen in many cases before, the density of lines is, is small. And very often, uh, it's much easier to distinguish between the, the powder patterns in this region and this region. Another a point that Ken Shanklin made also earlier in the week. So let's take a look at these. These are fairly similar. I don't, I don't know if anybody would say they're, they're the same. But there's a lot of similarity here. And these are the kind of determinations that we often have to make. <coughs> now, one of the problems, of course, is, is, is that of preferred orientation. And when we have to make a comparison, a judgment on a, on a powder pattern, you have to compare it to something, but you've got, a, you've got an experimental, a current experimental powder pattern that you, you need to compare with. This is perhaps an extreme example. That's the calculated uh, powder pattern of, of, of a compound uh, from, the, from the single crystal structure. And that, of course, would be the gold standard. And there's the experimental powder pattern. It suffers severely from, from uh, preferred orientation. And the question is, if you had to evaluate this, if you got that experimentally, and you, would, would you be able to say that that's the same material? So it's not so simple. What makes it simpler is the, that people become, people who are working with these compounds become very familiar with, what they're, with the compound. And so a person who, who was working with sulfathiazole would know that the that, that preferred orientation is a serious problem and would, would take care to measure uh, the powder pattern with, with a minimum effect of preferred orientation. And it would know how to interpret it when he, did, he or she did get such a, a, a gross effect. Uh, here's a case where the two powder patterns are very similar. And you have to look at it pretty carefully to see where those differences are. In fact, they're right around here. Jesus. I see what was bothering you yesterday, Chris. <clears throat> OK. You can, and, and you can see they're quite similar. But if you look, you can see some differences. And one of the questions we like to ask as crystallographers is, why, why are they similar? And how do they differ in their structures? It must be a structural effect. So if you look at these, that's terephthalic acid. If you look at form one, you form these nice hydrogen bonded chains. And it does exactly the same in form two. So that's, they're, they're identical. And now if you take the chains and stack them up next to each other, you see there's a, there's a little bit of a difference. But these, these both form sheets like this. And now where does the big difference lie? The sheets are very, very similar in structure. And that's why most of the powder patterns are the same. But in, in, in the two cases, the sheets stack differently with a different registry with respect to each other. And that leads to very sm the very small differences you can see in the powder patterns. So there's a structural reason for the ver for this great similarity between those powder patterns. And I think that was a question I asked Colin the other day about, about one of the commons, compounds that he talked about, um, where that came from. <clears throat> well, if you're trying to uh, grow crystals in I'm trying to find out a little bit about the, the uh, environment of the crystal space. One of the ways to do this is through high throughput crystallization. And, and one, of the, one of the places where this was developed was a company called Transform Pharmaceuticals. You can see it up here, which was founded in 2000 and bought out for $230 million by Johnson Johnson in 2005. And they, they took technology that came from the Genome Project and tried to adopt it to growing into high throughput crystallizations. The original idea was 100,000 crystallization experience to try to find the crystal forms. It quickly got reduced for many reasons, one of them being mainly how much material do you have available to do the crystallizations. But it got reduced to about 1,000. And, and what you do is you have an experimental design then you, you generate your, your solids. These are done in, in 96 well plates. Then you quench them. And, and then you do a primary analysis. We'll look at that. That can be Raman or X-ray. Then you bin them to find out how many different forms you have. Here you'd have three forms. And then you do a, a secondary analysis. 
And so you determine what, what it is that distinguishes among these. And then uh, a functional analysis, this, the y-axis here is, is concentration. So you're looking at differences in solubility of the three forms that were described here. And then you do the informatics. And this is one way to try to cover as much of the, the crystal form space as, as possible. And the, the importance of, of, of uh, x-ray powder diffraction comes either at, at this stage or at this stage. And the way this is done is you have these 96 uh, well plates. Uh, they can be, the, the crystallizations can be carried out at a, a variety of temperatures and temperature programs over a, uh, uh, different lengths of time. And, and you have these vials, and then you want to inspect these in an automatic way. And it's a typical inspection, so there's a photograph, no crystals here, crystals here. And, and, and so the quick way, while the crystals are in there, is to, is to measure the Raman spectrum, and, and then to pull, to pull out the crystals, and then look at the x-ray powder diffraction patterns. And you want an automatic way to do that. Are these two patterns, again, are these two patterns the same? And if they're different, how different are they? And can we get some measure of how similar and how different they are? Well, fortunately, uh, one of our lecturers from yesterday, Chris Gilmore, has taken care of that and provided us with a wonderful program which will computationally determine the similarity and the differences between the powder patterns, and I highly recommend that program. So that's the search for crystal forms. Very often we do it in a manual way, but sometimes we do it also uh, automatically. That's the, just the algorithm in the, in the program. I won't go through it. And the ICDD has also developed some, some software to, to do the same job. Uh, the example they give is carba carbamazepine polymorphs, which is sort of the prototypical problem in this area. And, and here's a case. There were actually 19 different, 19 different uh, entries in the PDF, and they wanted to determine how many of those polymorphs were the same and different. And using the, the ICDD software, you can go to the site and, and, and get that out, and, and here's the results of, of that survey. So it's this comparison, the same or not the same, which is extremely, extremely important. In, in, in beginning a pharmaceutical development, and then following it up in subsequent um, production runs. So <clears throat> that leads me into the second point. You need quality control. We've got a, the FDA wants you to be able to show that you've got exactly the same crystal form every time. And, and uh, here we have a distinction between what I call polymorph identity, which is basically qualitative analysis, which polymorph is there, as opposed to polymorphic purity, how much of each polymorph or a mixture of polymorphs do we have? And that's quantitative analysis. And <clears throat> this is a, an example of the, qualitative, of the quantitative analysis uh, with uh, this uh, prazosin, which is a hypertension drug. Comes in two polymorphs. No problem distinguishing between them. That's the qualitative analysis. And, and the question is, if, 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 uh, if this is being made and they want to make one form, how much of the other form is in there, if at all? And so this, this requires quantitative analysis using x-ray powder diffraction. And so for so, the, the people who, who did this work reported they, they picked out these two peaks from the two forms, the alpha form and the delta form. And the, it's the ratio between these two forms which can be used to determine a calibration curve. And, and therefore, if, if uh, uh, once, once that's been determined from any mixture, one can determine uh, how, much, how much of the delta form is in the, how much of the uh, alpha form is in the, is in the delta form. Uh, that's, the way, that's the way it's done uh, in, in this particular paper. But I'd like to remind you that some of the fundamentals of, of uh, of quantitative analysis in, in chemistry. You want to get a good function. And, and so this one, in this case, is a straight line. And, and then you want the reliability of that straight line. It's a calibration. And even better than that, you get a calibration curve with all the error bars. 
and, and, uh, and, and the different possibilities for deviations from that. That's the best way to do it, and that's the way it probably should be done any time it has to be done. Okay, intellectual property. Uh, you, got a, you got a drug on the market making three, $3 billion a year, and it's got a patent, and you want to be sure that your intellectual property rights are, can, are protected. So crystal forms, by definition, every one that you get is novel, meaning new, hasn't been around before. It's not obvious. It's, you can't predict how many different crystal forms can be prepared. Nobody can predict it. You can't predict how to prepare as yet unknown crystal forms. And you can't predict what the properties of those unknown crystal forms would be if you could get them. And for that reason, any, any new crystal form and the process for preparing them is patentable. Now, I know, I know that some people object to talking about patents here in Eritrea, but they're, uh, they, they're very important commercially. And a company that's invested a billion dollars in seven or eight years would like to protect its, its, its intellectual property rights. So what do you have to do to get a patent? Well, in general, this is just from the United States patent law, but it's very similar in Europe. A patent has to include the specification, which is a general description of what the patent is all about. And then it, at the end, it has what's called claims. And the claims define the invention. This is what I've invented. You can describe all the other chemistry behind it and how you make it and what its properties are. And then in the end, you say, this is my invention. And so in a, in a diagrammatic way, what you're doing is saying, I've created this crystal form. That's my intellectual property. And I'm building a fence around that. And that fence is used to protect that intellectual property. And the way it's done in the patent is by describing, is by writing the claim. OK? So that's, that's, what, that's, what the patents, that's what a patent does. And now, anybody who crosses that fence would be, would be violating, infringing that patent. OK? So how do, you define, how do you define your intellectual property in a crystal form? If the, the best way, the most distinctive characteristic of a, of a crystal form is its X-ray powder diffraction pattern. And there are two ways, mainly, that we do that. We either, we, either, we either use the pattern, or we list the peaks. And uh, if you can, the angle, the despacing, and the intensity. And so you, could, you can use one or the other, or both. And the question is, how do you define that fence? What do you use in, from this information to define that fence? So let me show you an example. A torvastatin is, Pfizer, is a Pfizer drug. It's, it's Lipitor. That is the largest selling drug in the world, $12.8 billion a year. And its patent protection expires this month which means that next year, Pfizer will not be making $12.8 billion a year on that drug. They'll be making considerably less. OK, so there, for years, when this drug was developed, it was amorphous. And then all of a sudden, totally by serendipity, totally unexpected, three months before launch, this, this drug crystallized. And so, <coughs> uh, so they applied for a patent. It's crystalline. And crystalline, and that's what the patent is all about, the crystal form of a torvastatin. Now, how are you going to define the claims for this patent? <clears throat> this was actually, this was re-examined later on, so that's, why, that's what that re-examination is, and, and we're going to that. So here's, here's the way this uh, was, was defined. The one means it's claim one, which is the most important claim. That's what's called the independent claim. And everything else is based on that. You can add to that, but that's, what, that's the basis for the claim. So let's look at this. A crystalline form of a torvastatin hydrate having an X-ray powder diffraction containing at least one of the following two theta values. And there are two of them. The whole fence for this patent is two powder lines. But this was a re-examination. 
And as a result of the re-examination, you can see up there, that was taken out. So now, this whole fence protecting a $12.8 billion a year crystal form involves one peak at 22 degrees theta. Is that good or bad? Is that good or bad? Let's look at it. One powder diffraction line. OK, I want, to, I want you to compare three, three cases now. That's the one we just talked about. OK? Here's another one. Crystalline peroxidine hydrochloride hemihydrate. This is Paxil. That's, also, that's a $3 billion, or was, a $3 billion a year drug. Is that better or worse? I'm going to have you vote in a second. OK, how about that one? There's another claim to a crystal form. A crystalline polymorph of blah, 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 blah. And now you see there's all these lines. And their intensities are given. OK? I don't know. I didn't count how many. But all the intensity is given. How many vote for number one? You got, everyone has to vote. <laughs> how many vote for number one? How many vote for number two? How many vote for number three? Number two wins. Why does number two win? What does the fence do? The fence protects the invention. And what do you have to do if you want to prove that anybody has, has, has gone inside that fence, that anybody's infringing? All you have to do is find crystalline, peroxidine, hydrochloride, hemihydrate by any way you want. On the other hand, if you want to find, if you want to, whoops, if you want to get, get somebody for infringing this, you have to find it's in the claim. That defines the fence. You have, to def you, have to get, you have to determine the powder diffraction pattern okay, of, of the infringing material, most likely in some pill. And you have to find every single one of those lines with those relative intensities. Every single one of them. You're missing one, you haven't proved it. It's not like a chemical paper. A patent is a very different deal. So it's not like in a chemical paper, you'd want to put everything in there. Why? You don't want to put all this in there and more, because you want to tell the next person how, how they're going to know when they got it. But in this case, no. So it's a very, very different world, the world of patents. So this is, so this is actually. This is the best. That's not bad, one line. The problem is that if somebody comes up with another form with, a, with, a, with the same line, it causes problems. OK, that's the number three. And number four, protection against counter counterfeiting. Now, counterfeiting of drugs is, is, is uh, an important and a spreading problem in, in the world today. To give you an idea, estimates for the size of the counterfeit drug market range from $75 billion to $200 billion a year. $200 billion a year. And, and it's increasing rapidly. So the last sentence, this comes from an outfit called the Pharmaceutical Security Institute. Today, drug rings in Asia, particularly in China and India, are increasingly churning out fake versions of popular brands and generics, then selling them to consumers online in the black, or in the black market. And they estimate that fake versions of about 800 pharmaceutical products were made last year. So how do we use x-ray uh, powder diffraction to protect ourselves from these counterfeiters. They're darn good at it. They're real good at it. Here's an example. This is Cialis. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Cialis. Cialis is in the same class as Viagra. So there's a big market. Many people think, that, by the way, that Viagra is the best-selling drug in the world. No, it's only, only about a billion dollars a year. Why is it not the best-selling drug in the world? It's one of the most famous. First of all, half the population aren't candidates. And second of all, of the remaining half the population, it comes to people like me, us old men. The younger, younger 
uh, younger men aren't, uh, don't necessarily suffer from um, that malady. But <clears throat> if you can call it that, many people refer to Viagra and Cialis as quality of life drugs. Okay, anyhow, these are, these are counterfeits, and they look perfect, like the perfect, perfectly good stuff. I, 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 a funny thing happened to me on the way, you know, there's an old, old joke on Broadway, funny thing happened to me on the way to the theater, funny thing happened to me on the way to Eritre on Thursday, I got on a plane, sat down next to a guy, who it turns out is from this company, Nano Guardian, I never heard of them. And he deals in this business, so this, he gave me this slide. And, and I'll come back to a little bit more about Nano Guardian. I am not, I'm not a stockholder. I have no interest at all in the company, but I, want, I, I, wanted to, I thought it would be interesting to tell you about what's going on in this field of counterfeit, counterfeit drugs, which I learned from him uh, last Thursday morning. So this is, this is one of the problems. The counterfeiters are, are making these, these drugs, eight, about 800 of them. And the World Health Organization has gotten into this. In Europe and the U.S., it's less of a problem, but in the developing world, it's more of a problem. And you can see in Nigeria, up to 80% of the drugs are counterfeit. Um, so this is a growing problem. And many of these are sold on the Internet. Here's, here's an example. This is what I had prepared before I, before I came here, before I got on the plane on Thursday. A, I thought, this is, this is the cat's meow. You know, we... We x-ray people can solve this problem. So here, here, here was a paper from 2007, and the title, Usefulness of Simple, simple X-ray Powder Diffraction for Counterfeit Control, and Viagra. Well, that'll, that'll get anybody to open the page, right? And sure enough, this is the genuine, and all of these are counterfeit. And if you're an unsuspecting consumer, you'd have a very hard time distinguishing. And, of course, the companies, Pfizer, which is selling this at a billion dollars a year, they want, to, they want to prevent all these from getting onto the market. So they, this, this method was developed. This, doesn't, uh, this particular example is not for, um, not for Viagra. It's more, a little bit more illustrative for indomethacin. But it turns out, and this was an, an article from man, the manufacturing chemist and Detlef Becker's works for Panalytical, so they're making the x-ray equipment and they obviously want to sell it. And, and here's, a, here's a, another good way to sell it. The authenticity of the tablets can be now checked without removing from the blister pack. So you don't even have to take it out, cut the pill open, and grind it up. You can do that all right with, on the blister pack. Absolutely no manipulation of the sample. All right? And so here's, here's how they did it. And they, that's, that's the x-ray powder diffraction pattern on the, on the tablet. That's the x-ray powder diffraction of, of, the, of the foil for the blister pack. That's, these are the peaks for aluminum. And so you get a perfectly good, you get a perfectly good x-ray powder diffraction pattern. And as I recall, this one took, yeah, this one took 30 minutes to get. Okay, so now how do you detect the counterfeit? Well, you go, you go out and you scan a lot of these pills, you buy them off the market, and you compare them. And I come back to the same question I raised before. The same or not the same? And if it's not the same as, what, as, as the powder pattern for that batch number that's sitting there in Pfizer, then you've got them red-handed. And so these differences are often very small. It's not always so easy to detect them. If you blow it up, of course, it's a little bit easier. So here's the case. These are the differences. And these represent infringing material and counterfeit material. It's not the same stuff. When do you convince the regulatory authorities that it's not the same stuff? And if, it's, if you're talking about infringing, when do you conv convince a judge in a courtroom it's not the same? The same or not the same? How different? Is it 90% the same? 98% the same? These are questions that very, very often come up. 
for somebody who has to make a judgment. And everyone in this room could possibly have to make that kind of judgment sometime. Okay, so that's, that's, how, that's how the x-ray people, us, how we can do it. But it turns out, <coughs> there's just an, a, an example of two, the two different ones where the copy is in red and the original is in blue. And again, they're very similar. They're very similar. If you had to say, is that, is that the stuff, is chemically or crystallographically, is it the same stuff? Yes, but not exactly. Not exactly. A bit, a bit of, OK? Out here, you can see the differences. Out here, they're not, not as obvious. And here, it's much more difficult to make the determination. So we have to make that judgment. And it's not so easy. And it's, it is a lot of responsibility involved in making that judgment. OK, so now we come back to Nano Guardian, my chance meeting on the plane last Thursday. And what did he tell me? He showed me this. They've gotten into nanotechnology. It's called the Nano Guardian technology. And they have a dye. And this dye, they stamp every single individual pill. OK? So everyone that comes out. And that's what it looks like on the, on the pill. You have this micro stamp that you can actually see. So that's the, that's the trademark for that particular pill. But not only, not only do they have this stamp, which you can, see, which you can view with a, ma a magnifying glass, they put on the manufacturing location, the batch number, targeted wholesale, country distribution, expiration date, on, all that is on a nanoscale. And it's all coded. It's all coded. I'm, I'm just about done. It's all coded. So maybe they beat us at our game. The x-rays are good, but this looks like it's absolutely fantastic. And the way they're going to be doing this, actually, as he explained to me, is, is they will sell the technology. Uh, th these pill, every pill will be stamped at the end of the line. Then, then they go on and they're marketed. And a company that's buying this technology will actually buy the service to detect them. So they, they recruit doctors who will write the prescriptions. And people go out and buy them. People who, are, who work for this company. They'll go out and buy them. They'll, they'll, they'll take them, they'll ship them to a central location where they can read every one. They FedEx them over, overnight or over two nights. And in a day or two, they can, they can figure out if any pill is counterfeit or not. It's a cat and mouse game. We'll see what the counterfeiters come up with in the next round. OK. <clears throat> What's the take home message? It's really pretty simple. Uh, X-ray powder diffraction is, is a crucial tool in virtually every aspect of research, development, intellectual property, manufacturing, formulation, regulatory affairs, and marketing in the pharmaceutical industry. And you can probably add more. And so we here in this room in powder diffraction play a very, very important, if not crucial, role in, in, in the pharmaceutical industry. And it takes a lot of skill and a lot of practice and, some, and often some very good judgment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joel, for a splendid presentation. Um, I'd like to invite questions and comments then. Again, remind, remind you to um, say who you are and where you're from. Uh, Martin Deriska from Australia. Um, the counterfeit drugs, are they the same active ingredient or is it, is it the same active ingredient in different fillers or is it a different molecule that it, performs the same? In, gen in general, in general, well, it depends how sophisticated the manufacturer is. In general, it's the same active ingredient. Those are the most sophisticated versions. Uh, there are versions where it's just a sugar, a colored sugar pill, and and then it's not. 
And it goes, it goes the, whole, the whole spectrum. Yes. Hi, my name is uh, Habibur. I'm from Chalmers University, Gothenburg, Sweden. Uh, say, <coughs> naturally, people are uh, selling, say, vitamin D from natural extract. Now a pharmaceutical company comes and they uh, uh, made a patent on the same stuff, but the thousands of people are extracting it normally, they didn't get the patent, okay? I didn't get this. So how do you get it? I mean, people are using some natural extracts and they don't patent it, okay? And now a big pharmaceutical company comes and they patent the same thing. And then now they come and then stop the small uh, natural producer of these things because of this patent. So you got my question? How you judge it, I mean? Natural, natural ah, natural extracts. Yeah, natural extracts, yeah. And uh, uh, I, I'm not, first of all, the disclaimer, I am not a patent lawyer. Yeah. I'm a chemist, okay? I'm not yes. a patent lawyer. In most, and you have to remember, the patent laws are different in virtually every country, okay? In general, in general, uh, a, a, natural, uh, a natural product or a natural phenomenon is not patentable. Yeah. But, that is, you can't, you can't patent a tree, okay? I mean, it, oh, but if you, if you extracted something from that tree and, and nobody else had done it and you, uh, and, and you determined that the extraction of that material from that or the material you extracted from that tree had some useful property, that's patentable. Nobody else did it. Nobody else came up with it. At least in my mind it's patentable. Again, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not, I'm not a patent examiner. But, but Taxol, for instance, which came from the yew tree, is, is a very, a very effective anti-cancer drug. And, and I believe, well, if, if it isn't patented, then the synthesis for it is patented, because there aren't enough yew trees around the world to supply the world's, supply, the world's requirements. So it's, it's it, but in general, if something is, you know, if a, natural, a, a, a naturally occurring uh, material is generally not patentable, but that doesn't mean that the use for that natural occurring material is not patentable. It often is. Yes. To continue, uh, Irene Mariolaki, okay, to continue this uh, subject, my feeling is that the pharmaceutical companies do not support the natural uh, extracts, probably due to difficulties in extracting, in producing, reproducing. What is your impression for the future? With about, about extracting, uh, about, a, a, about, de drugs. About, about developing drugs from natural products. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my, my feeling, I, 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 most, many, many of the drugs and, and, or even many of the drugs in, ver in various indications for various illnesses came from natural sources. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and my, my answer is pretty much the same as there. Uh, m many of them are, when you, when you find them, you know, it's from some toad in South America, right? And you can't, you're not gonna grow farms of toads to make this. So somebody has to, has to learn what the active material is and then synthesize it. And you're synthesizing that compound, and the synthesis for that compound can often be a, a very complex. So even the substance and or the synthesis, they're what are called, they're called uh, product, and then there are um, process patents, and they're different. G generally, you have to separate them. So the product may not be patentable, but the process for making that it could be patentable. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's, all, it's all on a case-by-case -case basis. All on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that, that I, I'm sure that most drug companies are all going all around the world looking for molecules that are going to do special things. I mean, that's, that's part of it. Because we're not as good at it as nature is, basically. Hmm. So they do look in nature, because I guess it's less profitable to look uh, in Cuba to find the right plant and so on. So uh, do, do they look, really? I, I, 
I don't know. I'm not, con I'm not in touch with, the, with, the, with all the drug discovery departments of all the, of all the pharmaceutical firms. But they're always on the lookout for molecules that will do something special, whether it's natural or, or man-made. I mean, do, for instance, do you, know how, do you know how cisplatin was discovered? Cisplatin is an anti-cancer drug, very simple compound. Platinum, two chlorines, and two amino groups, and cis. And, cis. and that was discovered because the, the National Cancer Institute of the, of the National Institutes of Health in the US set up a program to screen any compound you sent them, any compound you sent them. And there was an electrochemist at, the, at Michigan State University who was surprised that his electrode was reacting, his platinum electrode was reacting. And it gave him the cisplatin, and sure enough, and that turned, that, that turned into one of the most, that, that was a discovery. I mean, they screened it. And that turned, that's one of the most effective anti-prostate cancer drugs in the, in the, in the market. Hi, uh, Matteo from Stellenbosch. Um, a quick comment to what the guy there from Sweden was saying. Uh, if they discover a new uh, pharmaceutical ingredient in a plant and you are taking that plant because for 2,000 years you have been taking that plant, they cannot stop you, prevent you to, to using that plant in the same way you did it. Uh, but Something else, uh, you said um, the prediction of structure and the prediction of properties. How is the situation now? Because people are trying, uh, starting to get the prediction of crystal, the, to predict crystal structures and the properties. Would, would it be possible to patent uh, a predicted structure? My, my answer is pretty simple. I've, I'm asked that question all the time. My answer is really pretty simple. If I, if I, could predict just the existence of a crystal form. Let me make it a little, more, a little bit more complex. If I, could, if I could look at a molecular structure on a piece of paper and say, this molecule will have three polymorphs, two hydrates, a, hydrochloric salt, a hydrochloride salt. If I could do that, believe me, folks, I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd, be sitting, I'd be sitting on my Caribbean island and you would come to me and you'd draw a molecule and I would say, that's what, that's what I predict. And I would send you home to make it. Uh, but before I sent you home, you'd write out a very, real big fat check to me. <laughs> the problem is, if you think about it, can any of us do that? None of us can do that. To say nothing, of, I, if, if I only told you how many forms you could get, I still can't tell you how you would make it. I can't tell you how to make it. And I can't tell you what its properties would be if you could make it, if and when you could make it. That's where we are. That's why anytime you get a new a crystal form, it's not, it's not obvious. It's new and it's not obvious. That's why it's patentable, in my mind. Yes. Just a short comment. Uh, you can make a crystal structure prediction and you can get uh, the possible crystal forms out with a, let's say, medium reliability. It's me here. Um, but if you write in a pattern, this is the crystal form, and you don't write any way to get this crystal form, then everybody can uh, kill this patent. So this is of no value. Agree. Yes. Thank you. I'm Paolo Mazzeo from University of Bologna. Um, I want to know, if you have the same uh, um, uh, active product, and, uh, but you have a different excipient, and you have uh, something uh, better viability or something the better properties, you have a, a, a new patentable product or you are in infringement? If you, have a, if you have a different crystal form that has different properties? Yeah. Yep. Is it, is it, was, was the crystal form known before? Presumably not, so it's novel. Is it obvious? Was it, is it obvious to you, as what, what's called a person skilled in the art, that it would exist and would, it would have those different properties? Those different, is it obvious? It's not obvious. It's the same answer. To, uh, so to me, it's, it's, to me, it's patentable. Now, there are variations on that. It's never black and white. The, Amer the US Patent Office will not the U.S. Patent Office, in, in such a situation, would generally grant you a patent. But if you go from methanol to ethanol as a solvent and you get a new crystal form, 
There's a question of whether, is that, as a chemist skilled in the art, is that obvious to try? Mm -hmm. And there's a big difference between whether a, a new form is obvious or it's obvious to try to get it. Okay. And if it's obvious to try and you succeed, in many cases, the European Patent Office will not grant you a patent. In the U.S., they still, in many cases, in more cases, they will grant you a patent. But there's a difference. And, and, but most, I, I don't know if, I, if I'm crystallizing something with methanol, and I try ethanol, it's, uh, it may be obvious to try, but it's certainly not obvious that I'm going to get a new polymorph. Not obvious. In most cases, most of us as chemists would expect that we wouldn't get a new polymorph, right? Thank you. Okay, let's draw a close now. Apologies to the people who had questions. Thank you.